Now on BBC One, Inside Out. Welcome to Inside Out for Yorkshire and Lincolnshire with me, Toby Foster. We're at Orgreave, scene of the bitter battle during the miners' strike in 1984. Of course, there are two accounts of what happened that day, one from the miners, one from the police. Our man Dan Johnson has uncovered evidence which suggests that the police doctored statements, and that could have led to the culture which five years later on would see the cover-up at Hillsborough. In September, the Hillsborough Independent Panel released its reports into the disaster of April 1989. It revealed a catalogue of accusations against South Yorkshire Police, the Ambulance Service, Sheffield Wednesday and many others. But of all its shocking findings, what stands out is evidence that 116 police statements were changed in an attempt to shift the blame for the disaster onto Liverpool supporters. The new evidence that we're presented with today makes clear, in my view, that these families have suffered a double injustice. The injustice of the appalling events, the failure of the state to protect their loved ones, and the indefensible wait to get to the truth, and then the injustice of the denigration of the deceased, that they were somehow at fault for their own deaths. On the face of it, there seems little connection between the minor strike of the 1980s and what happened on the Leppings Lane Terrace. But tonight, we'll reveal how Hillsborough, far from being an isolated event, was in fact part of a pattern of senior South Yorkshire police officers manipulating the statements made by junior officers. And while Hillsborough resonated around the world, what happened at Orgreave in June 1984 has been left as a footnote in history. In the aftermath of Hillsborough, South Yorkshire Police systematically altered the witness statements of its own officers. Tonight, we'll reveal how five years earlier, the same force deliberately moulded statements so it could prosecute minors for riot, an offence that potentially carried a life sentence. They wanted to teach the minors a lesson, a big lesson, such that they wouldn't come out in force again. I was punched, kicked, prodded, you name it. I walked in and I was nearly carried out. You can see in a way that the, they were trying merely to set the scenario, but actually what they were doing was teeing up, perverting the course of justice. I was a bit surprised when I came in when someone said, we need to have this as a starting paragraph. However, I've never been involved in a situation where so many people were arrested. The violence and intimidation we have seen should never have happened. It is the work of extremists. It is the enemy within. Oh, what a lovely summer. Oh, what a long, long strike. But if we have to go through it all again, we would still stand up and fight. Convoys of coke going from Orgreave, men standing side by side, women serving the soup for them, watching lorries of coke go by. Rows and rows of men in blue, Horses, dogs, and truncheons too. It's in miners, they didn't care who. It's not so long ago that Yorkshire was synonymous with mining. Before the 1984 strike, this region was dotted with 60 collieries, each of them supporting a community and giving thousands of Yorkshire miners jobs. Coal kept the lights on and it powered industry, but now, only three underground pits remain in Yorkshire, like this one at Hatfield on the edge of Doncaster. The strike was the turning point for the industry. The miners, led by Arthur Scargill, believed that the government planned to shut down hundreds of pits. Faced with the loss of their jobs, most Yorkshire miners came out on strike. They hoped to choke the country's supply of energy and force Mrs Thatcher to back down. Come on, go. No way. Listen, go. No way. Listen, no way. But crucially, most Nottinghamshire miners kept working, believing their pits would be safe. The year-long dispute pitched miner against miner and against the government. But they'd planned ahead. Power stations had stockpiled coal and tough union laws made it harder for other workers to support the miners. 
Throughout the dispute, pickets and police clashed regularly. The most notorious flashpoint was the Orgreave coking plant on the outskirts of Sheffield. The coke it produced powered the British steel mill at Scunthorpe. During the 1972 miners' strike, the National Union of Mine Workers had famously shut the Saltley coking plant in Birmingham by sending in flying pickets. Arthur thought what we should really do is to have a one big pitch battle uh, like the one he had at Saltley Gate. And Saltley Gate, we won. Saltley acted as a template for the picketing at Orgreave 12 years later. Only this time, the miners faced a police force and a government determined not to be beaten. Almost from the start of the strike in March 1984, miners had been picketing at Orgreave. We shall be coming here and we'll keep coming in fast until Why we sort down wagons, out we'll shut it down. We want that place, we want them men coming out, wheels and backing us. We want them stopping them wagons going in. Over the weeks, tension grew and things finally came to a head on June the 18th. That day, around 10,000 pickets turned up. There to try and stop them shutting the plant were at least 5,000 policemen from many different forces across the country. The man in overall command that day was the South Yorkshire Police Assistant Chief Constable, Anthony Clement. The miners' strike is 100 days old tomorrow and today brought the worst scenes of violence of the dispute. The violence lasted most of the day. By the end of it, 93 miners had been arrested. According to the official police report, 51 pickets were injured, along with 72 police officers. But as with Hillsborough, two very different accounts of what had happened emerged. We were like um, a phalanx of, of Roman legionnaires lined across the field. Obviously, the coke lorries are coming through, infuriating uh, the, the pickets, and so the level of missiles appeared to increase. Police horses were deployed, and then um, on the date in question, um, decision was taken. We were taken from long shields uh, and told we were to deploy as short shield snatch squads. It was like a military plan. And when miners arrived in June, you know, sunshine, bare chested, and they've been picketing there for weeks and weeks, they expected it to be kind of the same ritual. You arrive, and the police are there in a great long line, and we push against it for 30 seconds, and then it's sort of over with, really, and the lorries go into the coking works. There was an understanding and acceptance that protest was their lawful and legal right, um, but these idiots who um, wanted to use the police as Aunt Sally's the, the anonymity that their numbers gave them caused the problem. It started with um, just a general pushing and shoving, and it, it was fairly much OK. And then it, it started to escalate where one or two bricks and bottles came across. They had dogs on one side, they had police on horseback in the field. It was like a medieval battlefield. The rows upon rows upon rows of these great long shields and up on the, on the bridge into the village, there were horses and, 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 and cops across the road. So they were surrounded and there were 10,000 miners and there were a lot of police. And they just had, I mean, it's like the decision went from Clements and off they went. The horses charged straight into amongst these miners. They were completely, I mean, they could have been trampled to death. The, the short shield units went in afterwards. They grabbed people, they hit them over the head. So that charge by the horses then, Norman, did you think that was justified by the level of violence that you were encountering? I was a bit surprised to see the horses, but quite pleased because it stopped the, uh, the bricks being thrown. You know, if the horses are coming charging towards me, swinging them big night sticks, I might be built like Gandhi, but I'm not gonna sit down in the road singing, we shall overcome, baby, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, of course we launched bloody bricks at them to try and stop the charge. These days, Michael Mansfield's one of Britain's most famous defence barristers. In 1984, he represented several miners in the first Orgreave trial, which took place in Sheffield in 1985. The video footage that the police themselves took showed a completely different story, not the one the BBC put out, but the police footage was quite different. 
there were a lot of independent monitors, some with notebooks, some with cameras, and one with a movie camera stuck up a tree. The, the police had no idea the extent to which what they were doing, their unlawful activities, were being filmed. So, if you put the combination of that package together, you had a record, a, a really almost unchallengeable record, of a completely different version of events. The police account, reported by most of the media at the time, was that the miners launched a violent assault on the police. They claimed there'd be no choice but to send in mounted police and snatch squads with short shields to regain control. A lot of the miners think that there was a concerted attempt at Orgreave to, to, to send them a message that they weren't going to win. Did, did you see evidence of that? Yeah, I would say so. The comment that we weren't going to lose, I think that was uppermost in uh, a lot of our minds. Coming from Birmingham, the, the previous miners' strike um, in Birmingham Saltley Gate, effectively the, the pickets had won by pushing through the police lines. And I wasn't there. I don't think many of the officers I knew were there because it happened in the previous decade. But it was something that, for us professionally, we weren't going to lose. The miners maintained they'd been peacefully picketing and it was the police who attacked them. The video evidence that was produced in court contradicted the official police account. So it had two stages. One is get them all in a field, charge them and generally batter them and hopefully they'll retreat, which they did up the field, down a railway embankment, huge injuries. Steph Wasoski was a Derbyshire miner. He went to Orgreave that day to picket. It was a nice hot summer's day. We were all there in T-shirts. They were in full riot gear. They knew what was going off. Obviously, we didn't. I just stood there with my hands in my pocket. I hadn't done anything wrong. Just watching what was going off. It was all new to me. I'd never seen anything like this before. At the next minute, I seen all these policemen running up field. And I looked round, see who they were running for. There were only me there left. So obviously, they were after me. When they got to you, did you put up any resistance no, whatsoever? No, none whatsoever. So what, when, when they'd arrested you, what did you think was going to happen? I hadn't done anything, so I didn't think I would get charged. Obviously, there was a lot of cameras there. Um, and when it got to court there, they got all the photos of me being arrested at Topper Hill uh, with no injuries. And then when we got to Bottom of Hill, I got injuries and I were in uh, their custody. So what sort of injuries did you have? Bruises, uh, facial cuts, bleeding. So you got a bit of a kick in then? Oh, I got a big, very big kick in, yeah. One of the things we did was we protected the arrested person as we went through police lines because I have to say some of my colleagues, uh, or not colleagues, um, individuals from other forces weren't above trying to um, land a smack on the head of an individual coming through. I wasn't happy about that. My prisoner, um, he gets to the holding centre in the state in which he was arrested. I didn't want someone who had been uh, injured who would then make allegations against me. I said, what are you arresting me for? He says, throwing stones at policemen. I says, look at me hands, I haven't done anything. He says, they all say that. So then I was marched down field, both arms up my back got to police line, I was banged onto police shields, they bounced me off, the, the shields opened and I was punched, kicked, prodded, you name it. They, I walked in and I was nearly carried out. Stage two is we have to have, um, if you like, a recording process, that's the statement process, done by another unit. And unfortunately they were caught out yet again because some of the officers who claimed to have arrested certain individuals plainly didn't because they're not in the photographs accompanying the minors. So basically the, the second stage process, uh, the investigation and the recording of uh, what happened on, on, on the field, if you like, at Orgreave, was a contrivance. Another barrister who defended the minors in court was Vera Baird. Officers signed statements saying they'd seen A, they'd seen B, they'd seen D. Important symptoms of disorder, but actually we got the logbooks of the vehicles and many of them hadn't even left home by the time those things had happened and been taken away. So it was uh, a clear plan 
to make this escalation of the gravity of the charges really work. I think the allegation is that we had statements dictated to us or something similar. Um, I was not dictated to with regard to the statement, but some of the, some of the statements in public order situations can seem formulaic. So where officers, or in my statement it talks about I was frightened, I was apprehensive, etc. Those are the forms of words that you use because in terms of the Public Order Act, or it was actually common law then, that, those are the things you express. The Hillsborough Independent Panel Report accused South Yorkshire Police in 1989 of making a concerted effort to remove damaging references from officers' statements. The panel found 116 police statements that had been altered to fit the narrative that Liverpool fans were drunk and ticketless. Later, some officers even falsely claimed to the press that supporters had stolen from the dead and urinated on people, while police officers attempted to save lives. At Orgreave, five years earlier, the manipulation of statements appears to be even more organised than at Hillsborough. In 1985, the first 15 miners charged with riot were put on trial here at the old Sheffield Crown Court, but the case collapsed after 16 weeks in spectacular style when it became clear the police evidence wasn't reliable. One officer, PC Stephen Hill, said under cross-examination that much of his statement had been narrated to him. PC Hill's version of events tallies with former Inspector Norman Taylor's recollection of what happened when he was asked to write up his statement. I mean, it was like a big room, people, there were different parts of the room. And I recall this uh, policeman in plain clothes uh, mentioned that we were, he'd, he'd had a good idea of the, what had happened and we were from different police forces and that uh, there was a preamble to set the scene and he was reading from a, some paper a paragraph or so, and he asked the people to use that as their starting paragraph. So you copied down what he told you to write? So that paragraph, I think, was basically the time and date, the name of the place. There were guys from the Met who hadn't a clue where South Yorkshire was. In fact, it was more than just one paragraph. The arresting officers may have thought they were simply describing the scene at Orgreave, but why did South Yorkshire detectives dictate a form of words to the officers? It seems clear the fact that the exact same phrases appeared in dozens of statements was no coincidence. To take just one example, 31 officers from four different forces used this identical phrase. As we stood there in the line, a continuous stream of missiles came from the pickets into the police line. There were no shields being used at this point. We got hold of around 100 police statements from Orgreave and what you find in them is fascinating. Officer after officer from forces across the country used the same phrases over and over again. So was it the intention of the police from the start to build an exaggerated case of riot against the pickets? And that charge of riot matters. The common law offence dates back to the medieval period. Prior to its use in the Orgreave trials, nobody in England and Wales had been accused of riot for more than 60 years. So why did South Yorkshire Police choose to use it? Whereas a picket convicted of a public order offence, such as throwing a stone, might get a fine, pickets convicted of riot faced potentially life in prison. Ian Hernan was a political reporter in the 1980s who went on to write about the history of the Riot Act. It was a very blunt and heavy instrument to suppress civil discontent. Uh, it wasn't used very often. Most famously, it was used in the Peterloo massacre in Manchester uh, as a way uh, of allowing the militia and the cavalry to kill civilians. It wasn't used very much after that. In fact, the last time it was that we know for sure it was used was during the 1919 police strike in Birkenhead. The real key to it was the process after somebody had been arrested. Two police would arrest one minor. They would take him back through the police lines to uh, an office and lock him up, having presented him to a custody sergeant, and then write their statements immediately. And in that office, as they told us, were some detectives who were dictating the paragraphs alleging the scene of disorder necessary to make a little offence like throwing a pork pie into a riot. The main reason, I think, why the Orgreave um, trial collapsed was because the police, being totally out of control and cavalier in the whole affair, uh, were in such a rush to arrest people, 
injure people um, that who arrested who was lost track of. So they, they didn't keep a note of which person had been arrested by which cop. So they had a whole big bunch of people and a whole big bunch of cops and they just made up who they arrested. And then they made up the stories associated with who'd done what. You can see in a way that the, they were trying merely to set the scenario, but actually what they were doing was teeing up perverting the course of justice because these men could not say that those things had happened and yet they were signing a statement saying they knew they'd be prosecuted if they got it wrong and coming into to court and giving evidence in accordance with their statements of things they'd simply never seen. Were you surprised then when the people you saw arrested that day were subsequently charged with riot? Actually it did uh, because normally the public order offence, uh, I'm trying to think of the normal section 5 public order would be the one they used. So, so, so even when you get groups of people on a Friday night or so, that would be it. Exactly we took the Orgreave statements to a leading Sheffield barrister to ask for an independent opinion. It's very obvious in the Orgreave cases that there was widespread collusion. Um, you can't get statements written in the way that they have been done here uh, by police officers from different forces involved in different arrests and find such a degree of similarity between their statements without uh, there being some degree of collusion. I've just taken one of a number of examples. This is a West Yorkshire police officer uh, who's involved in a separate arrest, nothing to do with this South Yorkshire officer. But when you put their statements literally side by side, you can see that their statements begin in an absolutely identical fashion. On Monday the 18th of, On June, Monday, 18th 1984, of June 1984, you've got the setting of the scene here as to the date. This passage here... Eventually, eventually the pickets the were pickets repelled were and repelled they retreated. And they retreated. There, there was, however, a continual a barrage continual of missiles. Barrage exactly of the missiles. same in the two statements. That's word for word. Absolutely. And then here, an interesting phrase, periodically there were missile throwing from the back of the picket ranks. Uh, but apart from this, there was no trouble. Now, uh, some other statements have the first part of that, but leave out that second bit. But there are uh, literally several dozen examples of, of police officers who have used exactly the same phrase there. I was, frankly, shocked by or grieved by the deliberate nature of putting together this case against men who were, after all, you know, some of them might have been occasionally violent, many of them absolutely were not, but after all, all of them were simply trying to fight for their jobs and that's what they were, were doing. So I was shocked at the extent of politicisation of the police, to some extent of the criminal justice system generally. And how strong do you think the evidence is that that cover-up that was enacted after Hillsborough was in their culture already at the time of Orgreave? Well, it's... Um I think the evidence is strong. This, this seems to, what happened at Orgreave seems to have been on the basis that the police just assumed that if they gave a particular account of the day's events, uh, nobody would challenge them or nobody that they thought mattered would challenge them. And so when you have groups of miners and the miners' communities saying that's not how it happened at Orgreave, we know that's not how it happened, of course, there's a parallel there with Liverpool and, and Hillsborough. The, the, the Hillsborough families have known all along the truth. Um, but it, it was an, an attempt by the police to set the agenda uh, according to the fact that I think at the time they did feel that they could say these things and nobody who mattered was going to challenge them, as indeed is the case, because nobody outside of the trial, nobody did challenge them and bring them to book. In those days, every morning at 11 o'clock, we would all troop over to number 10 Downing Street and uh, the press secretary of that time would brief us on Margaret Thatcher's attitude. Now, even though it's a long time ago, almost daily what we heard was uh, the miners described as a bunch of yobs or yobbos, that was one of the favourite phrases, uh, and how dare they hold the country to ransom. When we queried police tactics, we were simply told that anyone who challenges the government or bad mouths the police is the enemy within. No doubt at all it was political. I mean, before Orgreave, I'd obviously done other cases, and although there has been, by the establishment, a continual denial that we have political trials in, in the United Kingdom, 
In fact, they're a little more subtle. They don't call them political trials, and it's not a political offence. But essentially, the momentum is undoubtedly political. And so far as uh, 1984, and there were earlier strikes as well, this was clearly a political battle between, uh, and a political imperative. Thatcher saw the threat from the NUM as being subversive. And that's how they became the enemy within. So what could be more political than that? The notable thing about it is that because it didn't succeed, it was a mass acquittal, very little has been made of it. If they had been convicted and then acquitted again years later, that somehow hits the spot in a way that an acquittal didn't. So there is no doubt that um, amongst some cases where, I mean, for instance, Stephen Kisco, that was uh, poor dealing with forensic stuff. This is much worse than some of than some of those cases, though it, it's not dissimilar to the kind of Birmingham Six situation. It is a miscarriage of justice, but not in the normal sense of the word. Obviously, they've been found guilty and then had to go on appeal and then they got off later. Those are the famous miscarriages of justice. But there's a much bigger miscarriage of justice here at Orgreave. And it's not isolated because we see the same thing at Hillsborough. Not a single police officer was prosecuted. Even the ones that were caught on camera beating a def defenseless minors on the whole to the ground with a truncheon. There's one very famous case. Not a single police officer prosecuted, not a single police officer even disciplined. It's obviously difficult because of the lapse of time. It's now getting on for 30 years since Orgreave. But the fact remains that if there is evidence that senior police officers in the South Yorkshire Police did apparently uh, conspire together, and this would have been a, it couldn't have happened just on, I would have thought, one officer's say so. If there's evidence of a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, then in principle, why should they be allowed to live out their retirements on their uh, pensions uh, with immunity? We asked South Yorkshire Police to appear in this film, but they declined. They told us in a statement they note the issues raised by the programme and they'll consider whether any review is necessary. They've pointed out that no adverse comment was made by the judge at the time of the original trial. There's no doubt that in the miners' strike, the police reputation in mining areas just went crashing to the ground. I was still practising in the North East for many years after the miners' strike. If there was a case and the evidence was between a police officer and a member of the public, there would never be a conviction. So I think they reaped a very bad reward over many years. There's still quite strong feelings against the police in mining areas even now. For many people, the Battle of Orgreave had been consigned to the history books, and yet for the miners involved, there's always been a sense of injustice. 28 years on, South Yorkshire Police is a very different organisation today. And yet, as with Hillsborough, the actions of the force in the 1980s are coming under far greater scrutiny now than they ever did at the time. Well, that's all for tonight from here at Orgreave. But remember, you can find us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. The details are there for you now. And make sure you join me next week. When Inside Out looks at controversial plans for an incinerator in North Yorkshire and asks whether it's worth its £1.4 billion price tag.